being here. So Linda is the director of the children's ministries at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. She has served the church as an elementary teacher, a college lecturer, and a department director. She obtained her EDD degree in educational psychology and counseling from Andrews University. She enjoys working with children, developing resources, and writing for the Adventist Review Adventist World, um, ministry ideas, and other church publications. She's married with two adult sons and six grandchildren. So she's had some experience, um, and we would like to um, welcome her as we begin this session with prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, you know the impact that each one in this room has for your little children, your little lambs. We may never know the seeds that we've planted, how they grow, but you do. And so our work is so very important. And I ask your special blessing today on Linda as she presents and shares with us the ideas and thoughts that you have for us to take back to our children in our churches to help grow them and to plant those seeds so that they will be drawn to you and that they will choose to have Jesus be their best friend for their whole lives. And so bless us now as we uh, meet together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Barbara. Good morning. Uh, too bad I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> It seems like a lot of people sp speak Spanish, but buenos dias, uh, those of you who, who speak Spanish. We, uh, my husband and I worked six years in the Philippines, so we kind of learned uh, Tagalog, you know, instead and many other languages. It's a privilege to be here, and I know I thank Shirley Allen for inviting me this weekend. And only last Sabbath, my two grandchildren were baptized. And they were, two, they were, they were, they were 12 and 9. And this is the age that's most susceptible, right? So it's really uh, very appropriate to actually uh, talk about child evangelism. Because on our minds, I mean, in fact, our greatest goal, right? Now, I saw the title. It says, Child Evangelism Sowing Spiritual Seeds. But it seems like the printing went wrong and put S-E-W-I-N-G, sowing. But I think it, it just means the same. You know, you sow the seeds and we put them together. We hope that they will make a great... Uh, thing for us. So one of the greatest goals, you know, the first thing, I was baptized at 17, and the first thing my pastor's wife asked me to do in the church was, please come and help us in Pathfinders. So I said, what on earth is that? <laughs> because I, you know, being Chinese, we are usually Buddhists, and we don't know much about Christianity. And so she said, come and help with the Pathfinders. So I said, what kind of path are they looking for? I said, and so she said, um, well, you're helping them to find the path of Jesus, she said. I said, oh, okay, that makes sense. So on Sunday, I went to observe what those young people were doing. And they're all in uniforms, neckerchiefs, and, and they were all marching. I said, oh, I said, I think I know what this is. Because coming from a background of spending 12 years in Anglican schools, and so I said, we call them girl guys and boy scouts, I said. <laughs> so I said, a very similar uniform. Since that time, I was asked to work with children. In my whole years of being Adventist, 54 some years, I've only spent one year in the adult Sabbath school. <laughs> because when my children were grown, I said, okay, after they're grown, I go back to adult Sabbath school. But after I spent one month there, I went back to the children's Sabbath school. <laughs> because it was really boring. <laughs> And up there, they were always arguing and discussing, you know, and always the same people raised their hands to ask questions or answer questions. So that's why I say children would be more important. Of course, as we work with children, we begin to see why it is important, right? You know, we all know this text so well, train up a child in the way he should go in Proverbs 22. And when he's old, he will not depart from it in the way he should go. So every child is different, right? So we have to fit and tailor it accordingly. Now, as we look at 
uh, Ellen White with uh, I believe uh, Ellen G. White has really been given counsels by the Lord in terms of, as a psychologist, we spend hours, I remember, in the White Estate Vault in Andrews, looking up, you know, comparing Ellen G. White with B.F. Skinner and Albert Bandura and Gestalt Theory and all those things that Elder uh, Pastor Rojas mentioned this morning. And so I found that Ellen G. White really, in the 1900s when she wrote this, so many things were similar to what B.F. Skinner and all those, maybe we use a different term, and our educational pedagogy is a little different, that's it. Notice she said in Desire of Ages, it is still true that children are the most susceptible to the teachings of the gospel, right? Because their hearts are open to divine influences and strong to retain the lessons received. The little children may be Christians, having experience in according with their years. They need to be educated in spiritual things, and parents should give them every advantage that they may form the characters after the similitude of the character of Christ. Isn't that so true? Many, you know, I, I travel around the world. Seven months of my, the year in my work is all these different countries, children's congresses, children's evangelistic meeting, and children's camp and adult leadership training. Almost all the evangelistic meetings I've been to Almost 50 to 60% of the baptism oftentimes are children and young people. I say praise the Lord because this is the most susceptible age, right? The most susceptible age to, let me see, okay. And um, again, in testimonies, this is one of my favorite texts from a uh, quotation from Alan G. White. Testimonies, volume one, page 400. Children of 8, 10, or 12 years are old enough to be addressed on the subject of personal religion. Do not teach your children with reference to some future period when they shall be old enough to repent and believe the truth. A properly instructed, very young children may understand and have the correct views of their state as sinners and a way of salvation. Isn't that wonderful? This is the best age of the pathfinders and adventurers. When they understand, you know, last week, um, my two grandchildren wanted my husband, the grandfather, to baptize them. So we flew over there, and then on Friday night, we kind of, of course, the pastor had met with them already, but we wanted to question them and talk to them, so we did. You know, I was amazed. My 12-year-old son and my grandson and my 9-year-old granddaughter understand so much about the love of God and salvation and forgiveness and all those sort of things. Uh, of course, they knew the memory verses better than all of, all of us. <laughs> I mean, I was amazed when I said, you know, why do you need to forgive? And they quoted First John 1, 9. You know, it was just marvelous to see. That's why Ellen G. Huy say those children at this age will be able to understand. And one, one more in the last one. In, in the last days, in the children who were brought in contact with Jesus, Jesus saw men and women who should be heirs of his grace and subjects of his kingdom, and some of whom will become martyrs for his sake, and he knew these children will listen to him and accept him as their redeemer far more readily than would grown-up people. And it really saddens me when I see some of the countries I go and the leadership only, well, they preach about Matthew 18, the, the importance of children, and you know, they let the children suffer, the children come... But then I don't see in action. Too many times they say, and then no budget. The last group of people who get budgets are the children <laughs> ministry. And so I've worked with them through the years, and now I'm beginning to see, I have to say, it's really changing. I'm happy to see even in those countries like Africa and all those, where children are really not, not counted as anything. Children and women, two groups. And we have to help them see what children, when I see that family, the gift that they have. I'm sure they came from Africa. You know, the gift that they have, you know, that if we can utilize them to serve the church and use God, what God has given them. So, yes, children, when we look at the word children itself, I'd like you to take a look at this acrostic. Children are curious, right? Curiosity. Humility, Pastor Huro Hasaba, that's really one of those things that we must learn from children. Imagine. You know, I remember my son when we were studying in Andrews, uh, my oldest son, first day he went to the uh, first grade and he came home to our small little apartment. 
push open, you know, just flip open the door and I was cooking at lunch. He came into our room with 10 different friends, all different races. Kinky hair, African, Japanese, and uh, Sven, or some boy from Norway, Norway, and a Norwegian boy, really blonde hair, and all different. And the interesting thing is they don't speak English because my son spoke Chinese when we were raising him. So he just went with us to study and hear all these children. I spoke to them English. They didn't know anything, except the little Japanese boy who know a little bit more. But they were so... And he told me one thing. He said, Mommy, these are all my friends. I said, well, wonderful. And we are all from the same planet, he said. <laughs> I look at him and I said, oh, I say hi to his friends. And, and then this little boy, this Japanese boy, he's really cute. I said, you Japanese? So I, I spoke to him. I, I spoke a little bit Japanese to him. And he said, yeah. yeah. But I'm mixed, he said. So he said, look at me, he said. My, my, my mommy is Japanese. My, my daddy is Chinese. Yeah. And he thinks that, and then my great grandfather is American. He said. <laughs> and it was so funny, just, just hilarious, you know, when I look at him. Yet children are in their imagination, they have different ways of teaching us to learn. Yeah. Very interesting. They are less dis. Let's see. Let me put all over there, so we can uh, let them see it. Yeah. They are less distrustful because they trust adults. They trust each of us, and that's why what we say, what we do, they watching us, and we are being the model for them. So in whatever we do, whether it's adventurous, and you know, it's marvelous to see how children trust us, and what we teach them is what they're going to learn. And it stays with them a long time until they try to correct any misconception. Dependency, they depend on us. They have retentive memories. Yeah. Oh, sorry, the next one. They are eager, eager to receive, and no hardened hearts. Human, adults are more hardened in our way. But yet children respond. I see them come to... For me, I think Vacation Bible School is one of the most effective outreach programs for non-Christian kids, as well as our own Adventist children. I've seen so many children just coming to our Vacation Bible, VBS, and year after year, and how they joined some of our programs and became Christians and were baptized. You know, in China, in countries that are not allowed to use Bible, we use a different term. We call it character building school every summer or moral development, whatever the school is. But it has that same intention. So it's really wonderful to see that, you know. Okay, next slide. Now, we know George Barner's research from some years ago. And he's, there's, the George Barner group is still developing all kinds of researches to help us see why we need to look at this millennial group today. Yes, children below the age of three, right? 32% accept Jesus as their sa personal savior. 14 to 18, it dropped to 4% from 32. And then age 19 onwards, it moved up a little bit. That's why every time I go to evangelist meeting and when it comes to baptism, I can almost count at least 50 to 60 percent all the baptismal candidates are children and young people. I don't see too many very old ones. And so here we see the research is just marvelous to see that how we, you know, and then his latest research in May, we had an international conference of the family, children, and women's ministry in Budapest. And we had about 420 delegates from 60 countries that came. And I invited Josh Barner to be there. So he presented his latest research. And he found that, well, is his previous research still valid? But he said, it's the family. That is the key. The parents. And that's why we who work with children need to work with families, you know, to be. Because if we don't include them, we, will, we are the only one that see them once one hour a week or two hours the most, but the parents have 30 over hours each week with them. So that's why it's important that we keep in mind that. Now, the child fellowship, 
some of you buy things from them. They are very interesting. Uh, yeah, focuses on evangelizing. They call it the 414 window. Now, the Adventist church have for the last 10 years focused, uh, we have focused on the 1040 window, right? All the countries on the 10, you know, the latitude, uh, 10 degrees and the longitude, that circle the whole group of Buddhism, Hinduism, you know, and, uh, and those areas and and. The Islamic faith are the ones we try to preach the gospel. And so, but yet within this 1040 window, we have a large bracket of 414 window, which is the age group of children and young people. Because children are the most susceptible, right? Children are the most susceptible. Oh. Are you changing that for me? They are most susceptible to the gospel. And so they are often the most, in fact, they are the most effective agents for mission to evangelize their peer group. That's what the research from Child Evangelism Fellowship found out. That's, you tell a child, he tells his world. You know, that's why when one child comes to your VBS and he loves it, he's going back to bring two or three more friends. And that's how we get them. They are the best salesmen, you know. And that's why McDonald's is so successful, right? McDonald's sells millions of burgers, but who are the people, you know, in Singapore, now I see McDonald's almost in every country I went, you know. Amazing, on the little island of Sri Lanka, and all these little countries, you know, it's Georgia, you know, small little places, and McDonald's, the big M, is right there. Why? Because he captured the, the heart of the kids. Beautiful playground. Every time you buy something, you got something special to collect. Right. I remember in Singapore uh, some years back, they were collecting the at McDonald's uh, Hello Kitty with the with the costumes of children around the world or something. So you got Japanese, you got Korean, and all the rest. And the lines were so long outside, and I used to wonder, are they giving away free burgers? So I went in to check. So I said, are you giving free? Why is the line circling, snaking all the way back? They said, no, no, no. We are trying to make sure we can buy those dolls. You know? I said, hello, kitty dolls? <laughs> yeah, they want you know, the Japanese, the kimono, and then the Russian, and all the different ones. An American one was cute with a cowboy hat and all those. So you can imagine, they capture them. And that's why they are the... They know how to do business. And our church needs to do a better business than that. Amen. We need to capture the hearts of our own children so that they can go and you know, share with someone else. Okay, let's look at the next slide. In evangelizing children, we need to remember, uh, we need to remember the children's needs. Like Elder Roja said, love, right? Love, care, free to create, explore. They need that. Those are their basic needs. Need to be free and run and, and do things and activity. That's why the singing has to be active and lively, right? It may seem like satanic or something for some of the more conservative people. But, but every time, you know, my husband has finally retired the second time last year. So he came out, he went out with me to the programs that I went and he looked at me and said, wow, I never see you like that. He said, what are you doing up there? You know, we'll be singing and marching and, and woo here and woo there. And he said, oh, I saw a different wife, he said. <laughs> because he, he, he thought I go out there and just give lectures, you know. I said, no, I go to children's congress. I do different things for different children. See, so, but then when I deal with the adults, of course, we don't run around that way, I said. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it is something that is important. Okay, next, change it up. Yeah. And so we see, and another important thing is the child protection yeah, from physical and emotional harm. Today's children suffer more than back in those days when we, they have to be well protected. That's why we set up all kinds of, uh, you know, different things that, different procedures to make sure we safeguard. You know, other countries, they are not very conscious. So it was my job to go around to different unions, different, to help them see, hey, you have to. And we're talking about risk management policy and helping them to see why you need to protect children, why you need to give them a, a tag to make sure the right person come to pick them up, walk them to the toilet, whatever it is. See, over there, oh, well, you just do whatever. And nobody knows. And that's why when children are missing, 
is not a big thing. See, it's really sad, except the parents who, who are anxious. The rest of us, like, you know, it, it didn't matter. So now we're beginning to put in place all those things, and we require every church to write a, a protection policy. At first, they were really upset. They say, why do you want that? They're, they're only children. I said, that's more than ever you need to do that because you have to protect the children. You know? And so even when we, have, we run a, a Sabbath school during um, every five years, our general conference session, I tell you, it's on my shoulders. Everyone to make sure that every division, when the children are put there, when their parents, the right parents come to pick them up. And so we come up with procedures, thank you, and to help them. Okay, so those two points are very important. Now let's move on to our next slide. Who are the influencing agents? Let's take a look. Families is number one influencing agents because they learn to love God. They have never seen Jesus. They've never seen God for a little child. The person they see is the parents who show love. And then next comes maybe the teachers and other individuals. They are the ones who practice a Christian lifestyle and love that, that help them see. And then friends, friends influence children to attend church or turn them away from God. Especially when they're a little older, the peer pressure even comes in more to be wanting to do what the other friends want to do. So families are very important influencing. And friends play a vital role for the pre-teens and the teen, and especially the early teens and the juniors, because that's when they are, you know, always tend to be like them, you know. Okay, let's take a look at another agency, that the faith community. The faith community is the one that really, we sometimes think uh, the church is just, you know, a big group of people. Only some of our friends know our kids. No, the church family needs to be the spirit because, it, like the book says, it takes a village to raise kids. You know, back in my time in the Chinese culture, uh, you know, we all raise each other's kids. <laughs> uh, sometimes we don't like it. We say, "Why are you? You're not my mother." You know, <laughs> when my when you misbehave in church or some your relative or auntie or somebody or anybody you come and correct you, and then you say, "You're not my mother." You say, "Yes, right now I am." Right? Right now, I am in charge. You see, so back in those days, we don't dare because they're going to tell our mothers and then we go home and we get into trouble. See, so the faith community, but for our faith community, it, it must include children if we want to help them see what is this church all about. What's mission? You know, it's not just my little nucleus family. It, do I, see, that's why we want to help our, our family in the church love our kids appreciate them, get them up to be participate. You know, I attend a small church in Maryland, about 90 members, the Capital Chinese Church. And um, about six of us from the, working in the General Conference attend this church. And it's really interesting to find when I first moved there, I asked them, okay, let's all learn the names of the children. Now, we have 90 members, but 35 children and young people. So I said, okay, can we all learn their names? <laughs> But my members, uh, most of our members, 50 to 60 percent, are 60 years old and older. So 60, 70, you know, some 80, even 90. Uh, we have members that live that long. And so <laughs> we ask them to name, pick, learn the names of everybody, not just your friends' kids. But they say, but it's too hard. Some of the names are too long and we don't remember. So I said, all right, pick three. Every family pick three. <laughs> And then we ask them to build that relationship with them. Take them out on Saturday, pizza night, or whatever you want to do with them. Build that relationship so that the faith community can get together. And so that's why it's so important, the church. And they know that the church loves them. Forgive them, whatever it is they do wrong. So bring them to church and do it together. So that's why the faith community need to see that they are valued and they belong. Amen. See? You know, when my kids were younger, they went to Sabbath school, and one day the teacher said, told the children in Sabbath school, aren't you happy that you came to Sabbath school and you learn about Jesus and your parents? Then my son raised his hand and told the teacher, no, I don't want to come, but my mother made me come. <laughs> and so the teacher told me after Sabbath school that Terrence said, you know, you, you 
And so the teacher said, well, it's good, your mother, but she said, it's not my church, it's my mother's church, he said. Then as he grew, you see, we have to involve them. If they're not part of it, it has to be my church, not my father's church or my mother's church. And when many times young people, you know, when I, we, we work six years in the Philippines, and I go to this big IS, you know, the, the Adventist uh, University of Advanced Study, they are church. So I was helping with, to, to, uh, to partner together with another teacher, and we run the junior early teens. That's the hardest group. Nobody in the church wanted to run that one. Everybody chose, you know, beginners and kindergarten, and nobody wanted a junior. So we both did it. And you should see those kids. Those were the years that they always wear pants with many holes, you know. And they come to church. And a flabby one that sweeps the floor. And so we have young people who are in that Sabbath school, but they ask many very serious questions. And one day when these two boys were walking in front of me, we were walking to Sabbath school, but the, behind them was the elder. So the elder was walking really fast in front of them and told the boys, stop, stop. Why are you wearing this kind of pants to church? You know, they told, and they asked them, well, we like it. Shame on you. You now go back, because they live on the campus of the, uni of the university. They go back and change. It's not acceptable in the church. And the, the, those two boys look at him and said, you're not my father. Even my father didn't say anything. And so I said, nope, I walk you back to your house. Said, you know, then here I was coming from the back. <laughs> and so they turned around, they saw me. Mrs. Cole, he make us go back to change, he said. So anyway, I walked down and I talked to the elder. I said, well, let me speak to them. I said, they're in my Sabbath school. How can you teach like that? See? You know, my heart just breaks when I think they're so judgmental before we do. I mean, early teens, so we went in and then we were talking and the kids. And so the first question is, why are they so mean? You know, that's what the young people said. So we spent that morning talking about, and it's interesting, somehow the Lord always found the right time. The lesson that day was about whatsoever you do, you know, think and read. And all. Paul said, think on these things, right? The, anything of good report. And so we discuss, you know, things like that. It, you know, we, the church need to get together and not just judge young people. We need to help them grow because their journey is such a short one compared to my 50 years as an Adventist or 20 years. I mean, compared to those young people just going in, you know. And taking that journey. So it's wonderful. To, the faith community need to do that. The next one is mass media. Uh, the influencing agent has the, one of the most powerful agents right now for our young people. You know, music, movies, television, you know, social. You know, it's funny. I went to this children's congress in, you know, in South America where they all spoke Portuguese, eh? the Brazil. And, and, I, and the first thing they asked me, you, they asked somebody to translate it. You like frozen. So I said, um, frozen what? <laughs> frozen ice cream? Frozen what? <laughs> See, I didn't know what this frozen was. And so they asked me about, you know, frozen and all that. I said, mm. I said, I'm not sure what you want. You mean frozen food or frozen yogurt or what? Then they laughed. They said, no, frozen, the movie, the frozen, they said. And then finally, I said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. He said, but you're a children ministry director of general conference, they said. You don't know what it is? You know, so when I was coming, immediately the next night, I go into the internet to find out what's this one. All I know is they love it. Let it go, let it go, let it go. <laughs> so here I hear this song, let it go, let it go. So I said, oh, so that's Frozen, right? <laughs> so I was reading it to see what it is. Then I kind of watch a little bit to see what is this that is capturing the children. You notice the songs, the things they talk about. It's really interesting that how powerful this. And the books, and now the movies that come out, the last 10 years, the most popular books read by many children, I mean young people as, and teens and you know, whether regardless of what language they've been translated to, are, this, are those books, what are those famous books? Harry Potter. Harry Potter. And we Adventists want to help our children realize why is it not good? And now the movies, you know, how many movies 
when I go to the plane, I check one, two, three, four, ten movies on a, all different titles, but it's about Harry Potter. So you can imagine the, the powerful influence. Okay, the next one, next agent. And we need to really guide. If parents are not doing much, of course, what we can do in, in our you know, encounter with them in our programs is what we can do our best. Christian schools. Christian schools are good Christian teachers modeling those virtues. They have an impact. I can, I can bet that many times we ask people who has an impact in your life in the school. Many of us say my teacher or my Sabbath school teacher. Or, you know, that has, has such an indelible, left an indelible mark in their lives that they're able to, you know, think about Christian things, think about God, think about, you know, Jesus. You know, I asked my grandchildren, the two of them, I said, who do you think, besides your parents, I said, have a strong influence in you. First thing my little granddaughter said, nine years old, he said, my Sabbath school teacher, she said. Even today, in Mon that means the teachers, you all are doing a marvelous job in instilling those love for Christ, you know, in them. Okay, let's take a look at the plans for evangelism. Huh? There are, what are the different things that we do with children? Uh, plans like friendship evangelism. Uh, we teach children, you know, the skills of how to make friends, just like what we're doing with Muslim uh, evangelism now. We're teaching adults how to make friends with neighbors who are Muslim instead of being afraid. Every time we see someone, you know, who's Muslim, we, uh, we, strike, we think of 9-11 and we think every Muslim is a terrorist. You know, not all of them are. Only some extremists we can see. We need to teach them how to make friends, how to share Jesus so that they can be the agents. See, I, you know, I was in Brazil and I saw how they taught the children and they all went out and, you know, share Jesus. So this little boy and little girl and all that, they learn and it's just a simple thing they share with their friends. And then they tell, they took just a piece of paper and they said something like that. Well, I have to put my, unless somebody come and hold the mic for me. <laughs> Can you hold the mic for me? Yeah, then I'll speak on that. Now, this little, little fellow said, friendship evangelism, right? We are teaching them. So he showed his friend. He said, you know, there is a beautiful place way up in the sky. So far away that even if I fly in an airplane, I cannot get up there. Because this beautiful place, far, far away, is God's house. He said. And this is a place that we all can go there because we can live with God. We're happy. We can see no dying and no tears. But God's house is so far away that even if I go in a rocket, I can fly up there to God's house. There's only one way I, you and I can go, they tell their friends. And that is, if you believe in his son Jesus, who died for us on the cross, and he loves us, and that's why you want to go to the God's place. Thank you. And so they teach them to, you know, a friendship evangelism, how you evangelize children. And if I'm talking to a child, I would also use this, who has never heard, like Buddhist kids, you know, they never heard of Muslim, at least they hear of Jesus, because Jesus is counted as a prophet for them. Not the son of God, but for them is one of the, pro no, another prophet. So that's why through that avenue, we're able to help them. Now, use family events. Huh? Events, any opportunity to get kids here. Family night, Mother's Day, Father's Day, garage sale, whatever. You have some program you're going to involve and get kids to come or families to come. That's an important thing. Because once you have families, you know, if you get children, you get their parents. And that's why McDonald's is successful, right? You hook the kid. It's funny, I see in Singapore, all the parents love to eat out there in the Chinese hawkers uh, or the food center. But they go in with their children to buy the food, <laughs> the burger for them, because they are the ones who like the burger. See, we would invest in that. So that's why you get your families. You know, all kinds of programs we have. Um, like South America, they are very heavy on Passion Week, you know, Easter, because many of them are Catholics, and, and so they knew that was an opportunity to evangelize children. Is during, they have special programs 
develop materials, you know, to help have Passion Week program. And the whole week, from Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they would have special program. Invite the children there, and they they give them special. And the parents come, you know. So it's wonderful whenever you have. Okay, next slide, and we shall see what we can do. Use church services, of course. Those of us who have uh, worship service. Uh, a children's church, Sabbath school, in fact, Sabbath school. Sometimes I feel very sad. You know, when I first moved here to U.S. to work, I was a little surprised it has changed. Uh, back in the 60s when we came to school, we first went to Southern, and then we went to Andrews, and then we went home to work many, many years. And then we came back again for our studies. I found that this time when I moved here to work at the General Conference, I find that the... The atmosphere of Sabbath school has changed. It's like in many churches, like we first went to our Chinese church. Now, remember, Chinese church, Chinese are very conservative. They always keep on to the doctrines. And First Sabbath, we went to church. Only my husband and I were present at 9.30. Even the church pastor wasn't there yet. So we're wondering, what happened? I thought the, the Sabbath school started at 9.30, right? Nobody was there. 9.45. No one was there. Only the two of us. So I said, maybe they have changed the time for Sabbath school. And we found out that no. It, it, it just, they came late, I suppose. And then we saw that when I went to other places in the U.S. And I went to Europe. Same thing happened. And like Sabbath school has lost its vigor or something. That... Now, okay, you come at 10 or 10.30 or whatever it is, and some Sabbath school with no lesson study, or they have lesson study only. And, you know, like we lost that, you know, we don't hear mission, and we don't do those things. And it's such a waste. And so I said, wow, what's happening? You see, Sabbath school is an excellent time to get the kids there. See, so it's, it's important when we look at Sabbath school. Many of us spend a lot of time preparing for Sabbath school, getting the materials ready to have our children have worship, right? So special event service, sometimes we have baby dedication, next. Yeah. And special events like uh, Christmas, Valentine's Day, Centennial Celebration, whatever, we have an opportunity to get families together. That's an opportunity to evangelize. You see, So now each country has slightly different uh, activities or celebrations. Yeah. In, in Africa, they have special, like, you know, special days for... Uh, like Mandela and all those that, you know, maybe in our country, you know, here we celebrate Washington and Martin Luther King Jr. And so, so every country has these slightly different events, but still we should take that opportunity to evangelize the children because that's an opportunity to bring them together. Not necessarily, uh, now in the Far East, it's still very popular for public evangelism. It may not work in the uh, European like divisions because uh, they're very secular you know, postmodern society, not interested in religion, but many countries in the Far East is still very strong. So they still have public evangelism. And when they do have public evangelism, maybe reaping campaign for two weeks or one week, but they always have evangelism for the children also separate, which is very good. I think that's an opportunity to do that. All right, let's look at our next slide. Use the school time for evangelism. School time is a good time. Lunchtime clubs. Uh, we have in Australia, my, div my director over there, uh, Australia. Now, Australia is also very postmodern, secular also in many ways. And so she, you know, some, a few of her directors decided to go to some public school and government school and say, can we, you know, you have one hour. Can we do something with the children? And so they have allowed them. So they started a lunchtime club. And all the kids take their lunch in there and sit there and eat while they have a program for them. And they get to, you know, and they allow them to tell Bible stories. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting. that So depending on the school and the place, if there's a chance to meet those kids out in even public school. So through that avenue, she was able to, they make friends with so many kids. And so whenever they have VBS, they have other programs in the church, they invited these same kids that they met in the public school. Otherwise, they would not have. Uh, do done that. So it's interesting that, you know, school time can be chapel talks, of course, if you're invited. Now, right now, my director for South Pacific Division has just retired. And so she now moved to a little island, Norfolk Island, where they retired. 
and she gave her time. So she went to the schools there and asked, uh, can I come and give chapel talk for the elementary school? So I want to introduce them. And then, of course, they like the Bible one because it always teaches character development. And so she does that every once a week. She goes to three schools. And then she tells me it's really great. She gets to meet the kids and the parents and an opportunity to, you know, invite them. And, and so it's a, it's a fun thing to, to see that, you know. And then uh, one, uh, in the postmodern secular society, I find in trans-European division, the most successful thing that's happening right now for them is called messy church. Have you heard of messy church? Yeah. When I first heard, I said, what, why? How can the church be messy, you know? But it means that the person who started this program is uh, saying that all our lives are messy, but only Jesus can make it straight. So they have the messy church. The messy church is basically a Bible craft, you know, day. Families in the community, non-Christian, they bring their child, and then they sit there and go through with them doing some special crafts. Of course, the leaders try to do the Bible crafts, and then they socialize and eat and get to know them. You know, when I was in England, England is really definitely a a very secular society and also the European type. And so I met, I went to see their messy church and I met two families and they said, we've just been baptized into your church. I said, praise the Lord. I said, what happened? They said, oh, we came to, we came to the messy church and every week, you know, we bring our kids, you know, and they love it. So we come and your people are so loving and warm. So then they invited them for some small group Bible study, and they started coming. So they were baptized into our church. I said, wow, that's a great community <laughs> work. And in Australia, they had what they call the preschool. Um, pro, uh, preschool, like they, the church just buy a lot of beautiful, those equi- playground equipment indoor. And then they invite the community, those young mothers have children, and they're not working, come, you know. And so they have the, they call the uh, preschool groups, uh, play groups, they call it play groups. They come, the children play and play on those equipment, and the parents just socialize with our Adventist young parents too, and they eat and they become friends, and then they bring them to, to Bible classes, whatever it is. So it's interesting to see how different avenues we can reach children. You know, outside of the church as well as inside. Programs for child evangelism, next slide. For our for children, several small group, prayer group, baptism, children's retreat, anytime. You know, when I was in the Philippines, South Philippines is where most of the Muslims are. And so whenever South Philippines, and it has our largest membership, the South Philippine Union. And when we have program for children's congress, the Muslim kids come because their parents like them to know. Well, they say, oh, they learn about Jesus. Well, Jesus is one of our prophets anyway. So they send their kids to our VB, uh, children's congress. And then they go home, and one mother came and told me, every day he's singing, Jesus love me, and Jesus, and all that, she said. She said, but we grow up knowing Jesus is a prophet, but we never sing about Jesus. She said, but it's interesting, you know, and, and now they come and teach us, okay, pray first before we eat. I'll teach you in the, in the you know, program, so you must pray first. She said, so the mother said, she was surprised whether we should pray. And the father got angry. He said, we're not praying. <laughs> and so the mother and the, the children said, you better pray because Jesus gave you all this food. <laughs> you know, and the father felt so bad. And uh, so in the end, he said, okay, hey, let's pray, he said. You know, sometimes they, they, you notice how much children teach us, you know, <laughs> how, how effective it is. So when we talk about, you know, and then there are other things we can do for children, like children's church, the next slide. You know, children's church, definitely you can invite them. Now, I would recommend children's church not to be a permanent thing. I went to one place in Africa, and they have children's church forever. It's like, because they didn't want the kids to be in the sanctuary because they're noisy. So they took an action in their, nomin- in their church board that the children must be out there. So after Sabbath school, they just stay out there in the rooms with the children, with the children's church, and they never came in to worship with their parents. And it's really amazing, you know, to find that they, I say, 52 Sabbath a year, they are out there, 
with the Sabbath school teachers and they never heard, they don't even know much about what our church is. What is the mission of the church? What, do they listen to what the pastor tell us or testimonies of different people who share the love of Jesus, God answered prayer or whatever it is? No, they never had a chance. They were always out there in children's church. So we recommend children's church is good, but have it maybe once a month, once a quarter some places or twice a month. But according biblically, really, families should worship together. Bible theory, I mean the Bible teachings. That's why Jesus went with his parents to Jerusalem at age 12 for the Passover service. It's not to be separated. So many times, we, and we have to educate, many times we educate our parents. I have to talk to them even in my sermon. Tolerate a little noise because you can help children know Jesus. See, it's so important that sometimes we think, must be completely quiet and nobody, you know, and then they get blessed. But who is the one who complained to me? The Sabbath school teachers. They told me that we have never heard one sermon. Well, if 52 Sabbath a year you are with the kids in Sabbath school, right after Sabbath school you have children's church, what sermon have you listened? He said, we have not grown spiritually. Haven't heard one sermon from any preacher who comes by. And so that's why I said we have to change. In fact, I went to some of those church board and I even talked to them. I said, you need, you know, you must understand how children grow and how the, the adults need. But see, the parents are very happy to have somebody babysit their kids. <laughs> Sabbath school is not babysitting. Neither is all our children's program babysitting. I mean, it's for eternity. I mean, that's why we, a nature camp, we do a lot, quite a lot of nature camps, children's camp. Nature Camp is really wonderful. I've been to several of them, huge, union-wide. 500 kids, and they learn about everything from songs to activity, everything about the Creator God. It's just wonderful. And, and the children do activity and things that help them see, and they teach them how to listen to songs of birds and sound, which we are so busy, you know, we don't hear it too many times. But it's really great, you know, to see how uh, children's stewardship camps and we have many of these, you know, wonderful things. Vacation Bible School, oh, everywhere I see Vacation Bible School. All the ones I see produced that I partner together with uh, NAD, that Adventists, uh, I mean, Evan Source produced every year has been really outstanding. And they're translated into so many languages, you know, Spanish and Portuguese and Chinese and, you know, Swahili and all that. It's just marvelous to see that being, reaching the... the our division that has the most vacation Bible school is Southern Asia, which is India. India, every year, the ch student, you know, go out and conduct play groups, messy church, sports day in Europe. This is one way to reach because the other kids don't come to church. So they have sports day in the park, you know. And then the parents bring the kids and they, you know, enjoy that. They have music uh, festivals. Music festival is a very good way to reach out, you know, that they just... They just bring the kids and they play instrument and they get together and learn. And then they teach them not only technical skills, but also about the love of Jesus. And, and it's really excellent, you know, to see how, how many things. Are. Now, the next slide, as we look at uh, just a few ideas, and then I want to show you some of the materials that you can use maybe for evangelism. Yeah. Some of the things that children do is health expo. Now, I know America, you know, does a lot of that. Health expo is excellent. They give them, uh, you know, uh, they provide. I've been to Russia. I've been to many places, and I've seen them have health expo. And the kids just come, have a great time, and they learn about health, but they also learn about Jesus. So this is an uh, interesting, uh, there's just different ways. As far as your mind can go, your creative mind can come up with different things that you could, you know, to help share Jesus. Now, uh, many of you are aware of the, you know, the CEF, that CEF, the, what do you call the child fellowship, they always use the concept of this to teach, to just introduce. Yeah, I like this because I can talk to children who don't know much about Jesus or God first, never heard of it, and then they just show, you know. And let's see. Oh, I missed out this one. Same idea about the cross. After that, you can take some of these and use them, and uh, you can have them. And you just, you know, like you show, yeah, 
Jesus. This is called flipper flapper. Uh, we teach the children to make their own too. Uh, my life is full of things. I disobey my parents. I don't, you know, I did this wrong and bad. But yet, Jesus came to earth to die for me. He died on the cross to help so that my life will be clean and as white as snow. So that I can change and be transformed, right? And, and then he promised that he would take me to heaven. You know, usually sometimes it's gold color, whatever. To the beautiful king, to the beautiful, you know, heavenly kingdom where we can live with him forever. Just something simple that I can share. And then children will ask me, so who is this Jesus? See, that's when I, because many of us come to the, to the truth from the Chinese background without really knowing much about Jesus. So some of these, and then here also there's a book that says, Jesus is real. Just for children, you can actually buy them very easily. Beautiful drawings that teach children to understand what it is like. And then they have this glove. You know, it's similar to the, the love and uh, the sin and all those things. And then they have different colors and then you show different ones. Huh? Oh, it's, ca it's called the salvation glove. Yeah, yeah. And you can do it. And then this is called the flipper flapper. Uh, go to the chow. Flipper Flapper, this one. It's called the Child Fellowship, uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship. Yeah, that's where you can buy some of these. But we teach our children to make, you know, sometimes. And, and then draw the glove, draw their hands. Yeah, I have seen black color. Then, then Jesus came to die. And then what happens? And they make me white as snow. And, and then behind, then they, they show you, you know, if I obey and I study the Bible, I pray and then I get to grow. Then I tell people other people about sharing with my friend. So this is the excellent, different, simple things that you can share Jesus with. So now here we have uh, many of these materials I produce from our department. This is a health book and you can use it, yeah. And the next one is starting, okay. This is our latest animation, animated health DVD based on not the new start but the celebrations. You know, where you have choice, exercise, liquid, and all those. And they are always songs and all those sort of things. Okay? So you're welcome to... Yes, they're all produced by us. And this is the creation case. Many of you have seen it in Spanish as well as in English on creation. That's it. And this is our latest one that just came out called Say No to Drugs. Very good for community outreach, like mission to the cities. We use this. We use the health... Because health is an entering wedge, so many times we use it to teach. Okay, thank you very much for your time. And